I've known Danny for a little bit and uh, just have a tremendous respect for him, which is uh, always a privilege to introduce somebody like that. He is an associate professor of pediatric otolaryngology, head neck surgery at Baylor. And uh, actually, aside from his fellowship in Kansas City, he's really been sort of a consummate Baylor and Houstonian kind of guy. He started at Rice undergrad. He was a Baylor medical student where he overlapped, unbeknownst to me, for a year, actually, your freshman year of medical school. Uh, I was at Baylor as well then, Baylor resident. And then uh, since then, obviously, he's, he's become a faculty member there at the immense and world-renowned Texas Children's Hospital. Uh, Danny has uh, won many accolades in his career from favorite son award from his mother to Eagle Scout all the way up to, I think I counted 28 of them, uh, even more recent accolades and really just uh, commands a tremendous amount of respect uh, within our society. He's really one of the, the true pioneers in pediatric otolaryngology right now, doing something very unique, which is focusing on the kind of complex contemporary multidisciplinary care of, of head and neck masses in children. And his writings reflect this. He's a, he's a sought after speaker in thyroid conditions and the molecular biology thereof. And also at a national level, uh, you, Danny, have put a tremendous amount of effort and time um, into the American Academy of Otolaryngology. And so he's really risen through the ranks from a young member all the way up to uh, really have a programmatic role. And if you enjoyed Los Angeles 2021, you really in large have Danny Julius to thank. So uh, tremendous work. And we're, we're very proud to be colleagues of pediatric otolaryngologists with you. And we really look forward today to your talk on what uh, seems like team-based care in uh, the pediatric otolaryngology space. So thank you. Chris, uh, too kind, thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I, I do remember you when I was a first year medical student. I remember you, uh, I don't remember if it was coffee house or 12 days or something, but I remember seeing you with the senior class. And then uh, when I came to interview uh, for fellowship at Cincinnati, uh, you protected me from some very interesting questions with Dr. Cotton. And so I'm uh, eternally grateful uh, for that and, and for our friendship and for uh, seeing uh, for the kind introduction this morning. Um, there we go. So uh, my only disclosure is, uh, well, two disclosures, I guess. One is I get a small stipend for my work with the Academy. Uh, this is my family. Uh, and thanks to this little guy, uh, you may notice that I am using a deep radio voice this morning. Um, it's a good thing I was giving this virtually because they weren't going to let me on an airplane at this point. Uh, thanks to a little COVID negative URI. So I apologize for the, uh, yeah, the 1970s radio voice I'm going to have. Um, I'm also very grateful to uh, Candice for helping organize this. Uh, my apologies for my slides being a little late, but the, uh, the reason is that this is my average home life right now. Uh, and so uh, in case you missed it, the, uh, the, the helmet is real, but the ax is fake. Uh, and uh, so that's the, uh, the working conditions around my CASA. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm at Texas Children's. Um, I'm literally sitting about right there right now uh, with my office window behind me. Um, and uh, this, is, this is my home at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, where I've been, with the exception of fellowship, uh, for, for a long time now. And um, getting to work in a, in a, a large children's hospital environment um, allows some opportunities that I'm so grateful for uh, that, I, that I couldn't do uh, without the support of a large institution. Um, but I, I have to say, I'm uh, a little disappointed that I have to do this talk virtually um, because I, I have always wanted to visit Vanderbilt. Uh, when I interviewed for residency, the Vanderbilt and Baylor residency interview dates were the same day. And it was my only option to interview at Baylor. And my chair, Bobby Alford, and the president of Texas Children's, Ralph Feigen, had pretty much already decided me and my wife's future. So. Uh, I had to go to my Baylor interview that day, during which I listened to Dr. Alford and Dr. DeBakey on the phone for 30 minutes. And then Dr. Alford said, you're coming, right? And I said, yes, sir. And that was the, that was the end of it. Um, so I never have gotten to visit Vanderbilt, despite feeling like uh, Vanderbilt is in some ways uh, a, a major mentor, uh, a group of mentors for me. Um, my first talk I ever gave at the Academy when I was a, a resident was actually moderating a panel, the star speaker on which was Dr. Netterville. And he uh, mentored me as a moderator for that panel. We're talking 12, 13 years ago. It was literally the first national talk I ever gave or was involved in in any way. Um, Dr. Rosenthal held the position of coordinator for science for the academy back when I started in programmatic work in 2010. 
and watching him in his role um, was was a really wonderful learning opportunity. And uh, watching the work that he uh, did uh, last year on the AHNS meeting and what that what that took uh, to make decisions uh, about that meeting in, in regards to the pandemic uh, were very instructional for me. Uh, obviously, uh, I have many friends, uh, colleagues, and uh, role models in your pediatric otolaryngology division. Um, my, my dear former mentee, uh, uh, Nate, is your uh, otology fellow, or uh, one of your otology fellows now, uh, and, um, and many of my former medical students have come through this uh, program. So I'm, I'm really grateful to have the chance to present to you someday, I hope to see Vanderbilt, and, and actually very really specifically, possibly in 2023, in case you were unaware, the annual meeting is uh, coming to Nashville in 2023. Um, and so um, hopefully maybe I'll get to see Vandy with my own eyes uh, at that point. When, when uh, Dr. Haynes and Dr. Rosenthal reached out um, about an opportunity to speak with you, um, I thought about the different things that we could talk about this morning and, and it sort of fell under my two uh, main passions and where I spend the bulk of my time uh, in our pediatric head and neck tumor program um, and uh, in my work with the academy. Um, my work in the tumor program lends a little more to a traditional uh, grand rounds type presentation. And so I was thinking all about uh, what I could do to talk to you. And uh, Dr. Rosenthal said, yeah, but please make sure you tell our residents how to get stuff accepted to the meeting and give them some advice on being involved with the academy. And so I sat back and had to, to think about this at length about how I could sort of unite my two passions uh, into, into one presentation. And uh, when I think about it, uh, so this bottom, this is my favorite Father's Day present I've ever gotten. The bottom picture is my now three-year-old when he was about one and a half to two. And the top one is me when I was one and a half to two. And, you know, as a kid, I'm sure uh, I didn't say someday I'm going to be uh, the director of a pediatric head and neck tumor program, but I do often say that I have my dream job, um, that I, I really feel like I have the dream job of do doing what I get to do. And I feel very lucky to have uh, my position. But when I think about what goes into it, I think there's more than luck uh, involved uh, in ways that have nothing to do with me necessarily. And so um, Bobby Alford always used to quote Louis Pasteur. Dr. Alford always used to quote, chance favors the prepared mind. I, and, and while very true, I don't necessarily know that that applies to the world of pediatric uh, head and neck tumors per se. Um, I think about the things that are required to have a successful pediatric head and neck tumor program. And uh, it comes down to a wonderful sense of collaboration with mentors, uh, sponsors, and peers running in the same direction who are all uh, in support of the plan and in your ability to build those collaborations. It does take a skill set, uh, both in terms of uh, medical and surgical knowledge, um, leadership skills, uh, relational skills, and emotional intelligence to, to build the team and to navigate the difficulties of any complex uh, program. Uh, and a real vision for excellence, uh, a vision to change uh, the way that things are. And that vision has to be shared well beyond uh, the individual by, by the entire community. And so I would say that when it comes to almost any complex multidisciplinary program, and especially pediatric head and neck tumors, really, I would say chance favors the prepared community. Uh, it takes a prepared community, which is a little, a little different. This is not, I would say at the frontiers of medicine, there's not room for sort of the cowboy anymore, the, the lone person out there pushing uh, by themselves. Uh, that, that is a recipe for failure. It's a way that many of the greats of the past of medicine rose to their, their position, but I don't think it's the skill set that's needed to build today. And so uh, when I think about each of these components, how important they are to building complex clinical programs and have been in building my program, I think that. The, the collaborations, the skill sets, and the vision for excellence in our field are actually the same core values that drive the American Academy of Otolaryngology, and they are things that I have learned through the academy, most particularly at the meeting. And so what I hope to do today is to talk with you about 
uh, not only how we can leverage uh, prepared communities to improve clinical care and review the components necessary for that care as they've applied to my program, but also to really discuss how those tools and skill sets can be attained in the greater house of medicine, specifically in the academy, and, and how I've seen that play out. I do have to say, I feel a little um, silly talking about this topic in some ways, because I don't know of many better examples of building complex uh, communities to solve complex problems than uh, my former uh, fellow resident and your esteemed faculty member, Dr. Alex Gelbard, uh, who was uh, our Neil lecturer at the Academy meeting this year, and who has done that very thing better than almost anyone else in the field. And, uh, and so I'm honored to get to talk with you today. This is the first time I've given this talk. Um, and so um, uh, it may be a bit like continental philosophy, where it's a bit rambly with some truths hidden in the middle. Uh, I hope it goes well. And uh, I thank you again for the, the invitation to be on this very prestigious platform uh, at Vanderbilt Grand Rounds. <clears throat> so this is my program right now. Uh, this, is our, this is our team program. And I think we have to consider a little bit about how I wound up in this role um, because it speaks to some of the basic elements that are necessary for complex program development. Um, I did my residency at Baylor and did a number of rotations, both at Texas Children's and MD Anderson, where I developed uh, mentors and sponsors. I waffled a lot when it came time to pick a fellowship between head and neck and pediatric otolaryngology, uh, ultimately deciding on pediatrics and then going up to KU for my fellowship. At KU, I met one of my most important uh, mentors, Doug Gerard, um, who was then the chair of otolaryngology and now the chancellor of KU uh, of KU period and stuff. And um, a lot of the leadership lessons I got during fellowship were directly from Dr. Gerard, who I've gone to over and over for uh, guidance and support uh, in many aspects of my professional uh, life. Uh, after a time as a faculty member at Mercy, where I was focused on pediatric cancer, small volumes, but doing almost all the cancer there from the pediatric ENT side, uh, I had to make the tough choice to move back to private practice in Houston for my family's sake. We needed to go back to Houston. And the job at the time was in private practice. So I spent three years uh, in a group doing, we'll say secondary, maybe light tertiary pediatrics, mostly secondary, um, but also general otolaryngology care and a ton of sort of light head and neck work, uh, thyroidectomy, uh, parotidectomy, uh, and um, initial workup of cancer. Um, when you have Baylor and MD Anderson in your backyard, cancer knows where to go. Um, uh, when you, when you find it out in private practice. Um, I mark September 19th, 2015 is kind of the day that, that changed my professional life in many ways, because that's the day that I met uh, Dr. Ellis Archman, who was the former division chief here at Texas Children's. And he came to me and he said, look, we like what you're doing over on the west side of town. We wanna build a pediatric head and neck tumor program at Texas Children's. To which I said, yeah, yeah, right. Everybody wants to build a pediatric head and neck tumor program. Um, I don't know that I believe that. I mean, a lot of us in our world want to see that happen. But um, when, when Dr. Arjman came to me, he came with uh, a vision for the program and a support from the institution, uh, both in terms of financial support and in terms of resource support. And uh, when I elected to return to, to Baylor and to accept um, his kind offer, um, it really, I came into a setting where I already had institutional support and the support of my leaders to help move things. And those are obviously two foundational aspects you, you can't move forward without. Um, so when we started looking at building the pediatric head and neck tumor program, we recognized the problems of, that we were starting with. Um, these are obviously rare diseases. Um, we might see a single pathology only once in a decade uh, in children um, when it comes to us uh, with a child in, in significant uh, distress. Um, there's limited volume for surgical experience nationally, internationally, and limited volume for research. And the, the research volume is spread across multiple centers and around the world. The treatment pathways in children obviously are variable and involve chemotherapy, chemoradiotherapy, surgery, et cetera, and are not as well teased out as many of the treatment pathways for more common adult tumors. The anatomic presentations obviously are unique and require consideration of um, morbidities that are gonna be lifelong in children and that are gonna require specialized um, rehabilitative and reconstructive needs. So that's the problems we had at the outset when thinking about a pediatric head and neck tumor program. Second problem was when we look at the literature, 
these are basically the two papers that are mostly out there. Uh, X uh, <laughs> of the head, neck, and children, case report and review of the literature. Or pediatric head, neck, rare aromas, 16 cases from 1983 to 2016 in a quaternary children's hospital cared for by 14 different attendings under seven different paradigms. Well, and of course, and literature review. And so we, we don't have a robust pediatric head, neck tumor literature to work from because of the, uh, the basic problems that we already discussed. Now that is fortunately changing. And even in the last five years, we've seen an explosion in really high quality, well-organized pediatric head and neck tumor uh, research and, and, and papers. Uh, and that has been both in terms of uh, clinical outcomes and uh, in terms of surgical quality. Uh, there's a lot out there now on surgical quality in pediatric head and neck tumors, like this study from uh, my friend, Tony Shane, uh, on a nutritional status effects. Um, so we are seeing an improving literature to work from with our patients. Another problem taking care of pediatric head and neck cancer is uh, illustrated, I think, in this slide. This was uh, Times Square, September 17th, 2016, a day of yellow and gold to fight for childhood cancer. This is the turnout for an event to fight childhood cancer because who doesn't want to fight childhood cancer? We all want to help fight childhood cancer. Um, it's, 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 an, it's an instinctual reaction. Um, this picture on the other side uh, is uh, the major flood we had in Houston um, that uh, devastated our city about three years ago. Um, and uh, when this flooding happened, I had lots of friends uh, over on the west side of town uh, where the flooding was the worst, who were out in kayaks, uh, driving or riding around in their kayaks in communities, saving people, pulling people out of their homes. Um, and I, and I said to my wife, I, I really want to go do this. I want to go help save people. I want to like, you know, let's go to, like, go to Academy and get some boats or something. There were plenty available. Um, and my wife said, uh, if you do that, you are going to probably kill yourself. And you might worse than that kill someone else. Because you're, you're not a guy out there kayaking every weekend with a group of kayakers. This isn't what you do. Um, you're not an outdoorsman, hunter, gatherer. Uh, you don't have the skill set, uh, and you don't have the team to do it, and you're going to hurt yourself and someone else. And, and I think that um, that speaks to me to the same uh, situation we encounter looking at pediatric head and neck cancer and pediatric tumors, is that, that really well-intentioned passion alone can be dangerous. I think about one of the first patients I saw at Texas Children's um, when I started in the program, and this was a, a teenager who had had um, very incomplete resection of a desmoid fibromatosis at age two. Um, she had um, had subtotal whittling and resections many times over the years um, out in uh, a very well-intentioned community setting. She was then seen at MD Anderson, and by that point, the cat was out of the bag. She had chemo radiotherapy, um, didn't fix things. And when she came to see me at this point, her chin was fixed to her chest um, and she had overwhelming disease. And I don't know that her outcome would have been any different uh, where she cared for in the modern uh, era of team-based head and neck care with a better understanding of the biology of these diseases. But it, it certainly reminded me that, that we need to strive uh, for a better path and that it couldn't be a path of good intention alone. So the solution to all these problems obviously is multidisciplinary expertise and, and careful team building. The team needs to be focused um, on the problem. It, it, this is not an area for dabbling. Um, uh, it needs to be a longitudinally planned team where we have consistency among team members. Uh, and that means that it needs to be an exclusive team. It needs to be a team for any of our complex programs that is limited uh, in scope to a few people. And so I don't do cochlear implants anymore. Um, I don't do LTRs um, because I have colleagues in those specialty programs building their extensive expertise. Um, and, and I think that that is important um, as we consider building longitudinal teams in pediatric head and neck tumor care. These are obviously some of the, the components necessary for the team, which I'll talk more about in a bit. So when we, when we think about the milieu out there to take care of pediatric head and neck cancer, you know, we know we have specialists based in uh, 
the children's hospitals. We have specialist base in cancer centers. We have um, care happening in community hospitals. Uh, and a lot of times care starting out in the private practice world or in the independent practitioner world where a lot of these tumors are, are picked up. And no matter our best intentions, even if we decided as a, as a national community that every kid with pediatric head and neck cancer was going to go to the Central Dakota Pediatric Head and Neck Cancer Hospital, um, the best in the world, we know that the, the, the realities of, the, of economics, of um, uh, the administrative view of hospitals um, is not going to allow that to happen. And patients are going to wind up in a number of settings where their care is going to have to happen. And so we have to figure out how to build collaborations amongst these different groups to bring the expertise of each to bear together. The setting in Houston here at the Texas Medical Center, so you have Texas Children's Hospital, a stone's throw away from MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center, uh, a stone's throw away from Baylor College of Medicine, and an extensive biomedical collaboration between Rice University and all the institutions in the Texas Medical Center here. So that was our sort of starting environment. Uh, and then on February 1st, 2016, actually shortly before that, our index patient that really kicked the process off came to MD Anderson. He was a six month old with a melanocytic neuroectodermal tumor of infancy, which you can see here. And he needed a maxillectomy um, with a difficult reconstruction. Um, obviously you can't reconstruct a six month old the way we would do it for an adult having a maxillectomy with a very straightforward reconstructive paradigm. Um, and so uh, I'll never forget one of my former uh, residents who was a fellow at Anderson called us up and said, hey, listen, how do we trach a six-month-old? And uh, we said, please don't trach a six-month-old. Um, what, what's going on? And we, we used this case to embrace the vision that had been brewing between our institutions to build a truly multi-institutional team. And so our starting team uh, was myself, uh, Dr. Donovan, the chair of otolaryngology at Baylor. Um, Dr. Michael Kupferman uh, from MD Anderson and uh, Dr. Randall Weber from MD Anderson. All three of these physicians had been my mentors in training. All three of them had discussed pediatric head and neck tumor care with me, and we were ready to collaborate before we had the first patient to collaborate on. Over the first few years of the program, this was the uh, ablative team, um, but we had a vision to uh, try to improve uh, the ablative skill set basically at the children's hospital. And this was a vision shared by the institutions. And so my partner, Amy Dimashki, uh, who also did her residency at Baylor, went to Colorado and did her pediatric fellowship and then came back and uh, did a six um, month full-time fellowship and then six month part-time fellowship at MD Anderson while also building her pediatric practice at Texas Children's. And so at the end, she was dual trained in both. And through doing these cases, doing a lot of these cases under the close mentorship of our head and neck surgical colleagues, and uh, now together, um, the vast majority of our ablative work has moved in-house here, although we still collaborate with our adult colleagues all the time and have cases coming over in the next week, even from, from MD Anderson. We partnered with our uh, plastic and reconstructive surgeons, and, and this was actually a pretty strategic uh, decision to partner with the plastic surgeons because we felt like it would bring us the best of craniofacial surgery, which obviously is important in the longitudinal management of these kids, um, while also having their microvascular team. Now we have wonderful microvascular surgeons on the otolaryngology side, on the adult side at Baylor, um, but they don't do longitudinal facial reconstruction care in children. And so we've had this same reconstructive team all along for our cases. And uh, I think it's important, again, to have consistent uh, team membership um, to build the experience. Uh, I would say the two most critical components of our team are actually our nurse coordinator and our OR nurse coordinator. We have a dedicated pa pediatric head and neck tumor coordinator, Donna, um, who handles walking our patients through the entire care pathway and is their, their central touch point. Um, and then we have Kelly, uh, who now for all six years we've been together, has been coordinating the very complex operating room needs from multiple different subspecialties and their nursing staff. Uh, Kelly, when we started out, she went to MD Anderson and worked through uh, the instrument sets with them. She had some of their nurses come to Texas Children's with us for the first few cases. Um, and Kelly uh, has been a critical team member uh, longitudinally, 
not a physician uh, team member at all, obviously, um, but probably one of the most critical uh, elements for the success of the program. So I'll tell you about these three young friends uh, to sort of illustrate the program a little bit. These were uh, three children we saw in the first couple of years of the program with um, large mandible tumors. Um, uh, actually, all three of these tumors were uh, desmoid fibromatosis. Um, this child was from in Houston. This child was from the Valley, the Texas Valley, about six and a half hours away. And this child was coming to us from Saudi um, with very, very similar tumors. Um, for those of you not familiar with desmoid fibromatosis, it used to be considered an aggressive benign disease. Now, I think most oncologists and surgeons consider it a low-grade sarcoma. It has an extremely high local recurrence rate, up to 50% local recurrence, um, despite clear margins. At least that's what the literature suggests. Chemotherapy is controversial, um, and there's a lot of literature coming out of the European uh, sarcoma groups that observation for desmoid fibromatosis uh, may be reasonable. Uh, the problem is um, when it's growing in critical areas out of control, um, we don't have the luxury in head and neck surgery always to wait on it and to observe. So that is a highly debated uh, issue still with this disease. And um, the patients came into our tumor program uh, for evaluation. We start out with multidisciplinary tumor board, just like we're all used to in, in head and neck cancer care. Um, for global planning, as far as the elements of chemoradiotherapy, et cetera. Um, uh, a lot of the times that will involve national um, uh, tumor reviews. So we'll have patients um, from different institutions who are presented at our tumor board as well to advice on it. I think a really important aspect of pediatric head and neck tumor boards is to make sure that we synergize our knowledge base and our attitudes about cancer at the beginning. So when you, we all know when you go to adult head and neck tumor board, for the most part, there is uniform or extensive knowledge about the specific cancers amongst most of the members of the room. When we prevent, present a T4 oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, we all have a pretty shared view of relatively how bad that is and what that means from our extensive experience with squamous cell carcinoma. That is not the case with a lot of pediatric head and neck tumors. And in our first few years at tumor board, you would often hear uh, the neuroradiologist or a radiation oncologist have a very different attitude towards the cancer than the surgeons had, than the oncologist had. And in terms of how relatively bad this is, how aggressive we need to be. And so I think it's important to make sure at pediatric head and neck tumor board that we are very careful to review the, the available knowledge before decision-making and not to take for granted that everyone in the room has the same view of the disease at the outset. Once the children go through multidisciplinary planning, and we decide on surgery, then we present them at craniofacial conference and the surgeons and the, the, the ablative and reconstructive surgeons sit down to the virtual surgical planning um, with whichever uh, uh, medical device company we're working with, whether it's Cynthia Stryker, uh, any of the above. And we, uh, we do the 3D recon planning together. Um, and then within a week before surgery, we have a pre-op planning conference for every patient um, where all of the surgeons and clinicians, including all of the OR staff who will touch the patient, the specific anesthesiologist who's doing the case, and everyone who's touched the child's care sits down in a room uh, like you see here with uh, my neurosurgical colleague, Dr. Bill Whitehead, and then Dr. Kupferman. And we sit with models and we talk and we plan out every step of the ballet of the surgery uh, for that day. When we first started, those were often an hour meeting and longer. As we developed experience, we, we know uh, how to get through those meetings a little bit quicker now because we, and we've done it a few times before. Um, this is just a view of an operating room on the morning of one of these cases. And you can see the, the various different instrument sets, airway instruments, the plastics instruments, uh, the uh, head and neck instruments, the plastics instruments, the multiple sets, the multiple staff. And, and I think careful planning for these cases is critical because this is what it looks like when you've got ablative and reconstructive teams working around a small child. Now, again, for all of us who do uh, head and neck cancer care in adults or, or are familiar with it, this is a senior, it's not rare to us in the head and neck cancer world. But to a pediatric hospital, this is an unusual scene and requires some careful thought and planning. Um, one of the children uh, that I showed before, uh, here's a little closer up view of her tumor. Uh, you can see it in the, the left uh, hemimandible here. Um, uh, this was her virtual surgical planning before the case um, where we had a, a 3D model of the tumor. Um, 
but as we're going through the VSP on this, um, we have to help our reconstructive colleagues understand that desmoid fibromatosis loves to crawl through tissue planes. Um, and when you think you're all the way around desmoid fibromatosis surgically, you are frequently not. You will frequently find more at the margins, even with a well done oncologically respective surgery. And so as we do the virtual surgical planning, we really have to plan to go far, far, far beyond what we think the tumor resection is gonna be and to have redundancy planned in, in case we wind up taking a whole lot more uh, than we were thinking about. That was this kid's case where we wound up going well across the mandible, uh, chasing positive desmoid in the bone marrow until we got to a, a clear margin. So here's her surgery. Uh, here you can see the tumor exposed. Uh, here's the, the tumor uh, removed and after uh, our, our neck dissection. Um, here you can see uh, the uh, fibula flap on the virtual surgical planning guides, the fibula flap attached to the reconstruction plate. Um, she uh, was out of the hospital by day 16, having been decannulated and eating a soft diet. Um, and she's done really well over the years, has remained NED. Um, our next uh, complex discussion for her is dental rehabilitation, which is a whole different set of uh, economic problems and um, limited expertise in rebuilding teeth in children who have undergone these types of surgeries. But we just got a, a million dollar grant from um, uh, the state to actually provide dental rehabilitation for our patients when they're ready. Uh, an interesting thing that she taught us is that, you know, we, we like to think that, that once you put a free flap in this native mandible, the traditional teaching has been that it's not gonna grow. Um, but actually when we uh, use this, um, this is called the Materialized Innovation Suite. And it basically tracks growth in bones over time and looks for change in bone. This was her prior to ablation. Here she is at the reconstruction. And here she is uh, two years down the road. And you see, we've still got a relatively symmetric uh, mandible here. And we've seen growth in these red areas that is actually relatively symmetric. And when we look at her uh, 3D reconstruction of her mandible, she actually is growing. And uh, the lesson that this taught me was that if you have a way to save the condyle in these uh, mandibulectomies, the kids can still grow a symmetric mandible. Our kids where we've had to take the condyle have not done as well and have had a lot of problems with deviation and with asymmetric growth subsequently. One such example is this child, another kid with desmoid fibromatosis, um, who unfortunately had a tumor that was well up at the skull base and that was growing rapidly. We attempted uh, chemotherapy to try to arrest growth and this tumor just kept right on growing. And so we took her for hemimandibulectomy, had to take her condyle and uh, sort of uh, skull based dissection. Here was her reconstruction. And unfortunately, uh, she had a massive recurrence um, um, about a year later. And this challenged my thoughts about being honest with myself and our field being honest about margins, because the teaching in desmoid fibromatosis is that margins don't matter. You can take as much as you want, and there's a 50% regrowth rate. But I have to be honest, in my heart of hearts, and I think all of us can see looking at this, where she recurred was the hardest place for me to get to, no question. And, and I did this case, it was Michael Kupferman and I did this together. It, it, there's no question. Where she recurred was way up here in the corner where we had the least view um, way up behind, um, way up behind the parotid gland. She went on to a total parotidectomy, neck dissection, and she is now NED. But um, I think it underscored for me the fact that we all know that marginal assessment is difficult in the head and neck. And I think we have to take that understanding into our review of the literature when we're thinking about how to approach rare pediatric head and neck tumors and to take a honest, you know, to take with intellectual integrity, to be honest with ourselves about our abilities. Uh, I just shared this case to say that um, as we think about reconstructions, we spent a lot of time collaborating with um, our industry partners on various different reconstruction options. So this patient had a maxillectomy, total orbital floor removal, and we actually worked with a company to make a customized peak implant for her. Now we're using Medpour for customized implants, but there's a lot of interaction with industry colleagues on uh, custom reconstructions for these children um, when they have these resections. So over the last five years, as we've been building as a program, uh, this is you know, some of the types of malignancies uh, and uh, aggressive local things we've been handling. 
And if we look at our volumes, um, this graph is our volumes of, of multidisciplinary complex ablative reconstructive cases. Um, the blue is the cases we did with our uh, Anderson colleagues initially. And the change here was when Dr. Damashki joined our program and um, our volumes have remained relatively stable, but um, we, we have done most of the cases in house at this point, um, except when we have a child at Anderson who, who really would benefit from having the perioperative ICU level care at Texas Children and the care of our team that is used to caring for children now with these kind of ablations and reconstruction. This is our volume of, I would say, advanced pediatric head and neck uh, tumor care, uh, including complex parotids, um, complex neck dissections, um, but things that don't necessarily involve reconstruction with the plastic surgeons. And, you know, this, is, this has been the, the blessing of having um, a focused team is that more kids are finding us and um, that our experience is growing uh, with, with them. And so, you know, this year we'll uh, probably wind up um, based on the OR schedule at about 80 cases. And um, I hope that what this reflects is that, and, and what I think it reflects is that kids are, are, and parents are getting savvy to the fact that um, there are teams out there. Um, I love this quote from Harvey Cushing. Uh, I would like to see the day when somebody would be appointed surgeon somewhere who had no hands for the operative part is the least part of the work. Um, I shared this with a graduating fellow once uh, in a note I wrote to them, and, and they were like were really upset that I was insulting their their hand skills. I said, no, no, that, that's not it. I'm just saying that there's a lot more to it than just what goes on in the OR, particularly in what we do. Um, with ex with volume, you can build experience. With experience, you can build pathways. And once you have a pathway, you can start doing quality improvement by seeing where the deviations are in your in your pathway. You can, for example, look at how to better coordinate and consolidate your visits and consolidate diagnostics. So there's not redundancy, and so that kids are getting through the workup in a more efficient manner. Um, we've built out our PICU protocols so that we can handle our sedation weans and our post-op care more smoothly. Um, we've built a rapid decannulation protocol since decannulating little kids with um, short-term tracheostomies uh, for perioperative care is a little different than decannulating adults. And so um, this is actually under review right now for publication. Um, but we, we have a very careful pathway um, with expected points to time to each of the critical events in decannulation. And when we see a kid deviating from one of these points, we know that something is going amiss and that we need to intervene. So I would say uh, the, the major lessons we've learned in the program so far, success begins with a focused collaborative team. Um, everyone's got to leave their ego at the door. There's, there's no room for... Um, there's no room for bravado, and, and we have to have a healthy respect for the problem and for our colleagues. Um, it takes longitudinal commitment, and we have to communicate with each other oh so much uh, to make it all happen. Um, we don't need to go long. Um, so there, there is a pediatric head and neck tumor group that we all kind of think in the peach world are aware of nationally who have this wonderful go long award for cases that are um, uh, sort of require extra effort that go beyond sort of the norm that, that really push the margins of what we can do. And I think that that, that is uh, something that there definitely needs to be an element of nationally in our care. But I don't think that should be our goal in pediatric head and neck tumor care at this point. I think we need to be aiming for excellence and consistency by building programs that can handle these types of cases where when we're seeing something in the pediatric setting, there's not a sense that what we're doing is something extraordinary and that what we're doing is something rare and random that we don't often do. Um, we gave a lecture a couple of years ago on, on quality in pediatric head and neck cancer with Dr. Randy Weber, um, who you know has been a leader in quality in uh, adult head and neck cancer care. And he said uh, pretty pointedly at the academy that we need to be considering um, coordinating these cases through, through regional centers national centers uh, so that places like Vanderbilt and like Texas Children's are handling uh, kids um, to give them the best potential quality. Uh, I have gone back many times to Dr. John Ridge's presidential address from the AHNS in 2010, the title of which was, We Show Pictures, They Show Curves. Especially with the trainees, if you haven't read his address, it, it really reveals a lot about the, the thought in head and neck surgery at the time and has a lot of lessons I think that are important for us to remember uh, in our work. Um, pictures show what we can do. Um, they, they demonstrate that we're capable of doing something, 
but, but they, they shouldn't necessarily be dismissed as a lack of evidence because it's a different kind of evidence. Uh, when, when our oncology colleagues look at uh, curves, when they look at curves showing morbidity and mortality in care, um, it's a very different kind of morbidity than what we can appreciate when we are laying our hands on a child, when we've, when we've operated on them and watched the morbidity in front of our eyes. Um, and so we don't wanna discount the evidence that we get in, in pictures of our patients, but we do need to move towards curves in terms of showing um, extensive multi-institutional research um, and outcomes in pediatric head and neck care um, and uh, in terms of optimizing perioperative care, um, we need the collaborations to move towards, towards the curves in our research that our oncology colleagues are used to and that frankly define adult head and neck cancer care at this point uh, as well. And finally, the bigger the vision, the bigger the community you need. And so I, I love to share this picture of our um, pediatric thyroid tumor program at Texas Children's. Um, this was a paper that we recently published um, on how the thyroid program developed and on how the collaborations between surgery, otolaryngology, oncology, endocrinology led to improved outcomes from the onset of the program on. And I'd like to especially highlight my colleague, Dr. Monica Lopez, um, uh, who was the surgical director of the program, my close friend and collaborator, and uh, really the leader as we built our team and curses Vanderbilt, you stole her. Uh, she's there now and uh, is a wonderful uh, thyroid surgeon, surgeon and, and human who I, I miss terribly. Um, we've built national collaborations. This is sort of the thyroid collaboration through the uh, AHNS. These are all folks who are members of both AHNS and uh, ASPO who focus on pediatric thyroid care. And one of the benefits of having this team has been that the research has started to come out of the group. Um, we just published uh, prevalence and risk factors for multifocality and pediatric thyroid cancer um, in, uh, in JAMA Odo and showed that there is a pretty significant risk of unexpected multifocal disease. And so this is going to hopefully inform our discussions about lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy for kids going forward. Um, so when I think about those tools and skills that allowed us to build our head and neck program, um, I think a key moment was when I met my, my partner in crime, Jeff Rastetter, who has a similar uh, program and vision at Lurie Children's up in Chicago. Um, we were introduced at the Academy meeting uh, by a mutual colleague, and we've now been doing multi-center research projects, presenting, sharing cases together, and pushing each other's programs for years. And um, you know, we, we got to see each other again, finally, at the Academy meeting in LA after a couple of years apart. And, and uh, I mean, it was wonderful to see my dear friend, uh, but it was also inspiring and motivational for me to come home and improve things um, as we share and talk about our experience. And I think that there's nowhere that I've developed the collaborative resources I have, as well as the skill sets I needed for my program than at the Academy. I think that when I think about what the Academy has given me in terms of resources, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing here in Houston without my experience there. Um, I think most of us, when we start in otolaryngology residency, we're aware vaguely that there is an academy, whatever that, that is, that there's an academy meeting, that it's the, uh, that it's the other one, that's the not COSM meeting, um, and uh, that there is some kind of organization that hopefully someday we'll be part of, but um, the, you know, it's kind of mixed in with the board and whatnot. Um, our Academy's uh, mission is to engage members and help them achieve excellence and provide high quality, evidence-informed and equitable ear, nose and throat care. Um, the vision statement's been revised um, every three to five years. And uh, this was a brand new revision that came out under Dr. Carol Bradford's leadership last year. The Academy began in 1896 when Hal Foster reached out to 500 otolaryngologists spread across the Midwest and the West to get together in Kansas City to uh, share papers and to try to get organized. At the time, most of the uh, exceptional otolaryngology was on the East Coast in institutions that had training, uh, that had individuals who trained in Europe for the most part. Um, and uh, you know, the Triologic Society, for example, was arising in, in the New York area for academics on the East Coast. But once otolaryngologists were sort of out on their own in the West, there was not a lot of opportunity for education, for collaboration, for socialization. And it was Hal Foster's vision to create that opportunity 
for the average otolaryngologist who was not in the academic centers back east. And so there's some debate about how many actually showed up to the first meeting. There were 36 to 50, and they each came with a paper. And I love the descriptions of the papers as you look at the original program from that 1896 meeting. Uh, the very first one was presented by Dr. Carl Bark, um, who was actually an ophthalmologist in the end. Um, two cases of opening of the lateral sinus for the removal of infectious thrombus, recovery in one, one case. And what I love in the program is that it describes that the discussion was then opened by Dr. William Shepagrell. William Shepagrell was actually an allergist from New Orleans who went on to become president of the academy uh, in the future. But each of these papers was hotly debated, discussed, and contested um, at the original meeting. And that really set a model for what we've been doing for the last 125 years with the science in our field at the annual meeting. Um, the the uh, Western Society uh, became the American Academy of Otolaryngology and Ophthalmology in the early 1900s. And really, it created the first medical boards. It created the boards of otolaryngology and ophthalmology. And so although our, our board and our academy are very distinct entities today, the one rose from the other. Um, and, and that was, uh, that was uh, very innovative uh, at the time in medicine. In 1921, the academy created a postgraduate supplement course to help members prepare to take these boards. And that grew into the instruction course and panel presentation programs that we have today at the annual meeting. Um, President New said, few societies have the far-sighted and necessary cooperation of its members to permit the development of a broad and useful instruction program. The fact that our society today represents one of the greatest educational projects in the world should be gratifying to us all and the enduring satisfaction to Dr. Foster. So even by 1945, the Academy meeting was a widely well-regarded educational source for otolaryngologists and ophthalmologists. Uh, the Academies of Otolaryngology and Ophthalmology split in 1978. Now, at the same time, while the American Academy of Otolaryngology was focused on education and science, the uh, American Council of Otolaryngology was focused on the blossoming uh, economic and political environment surrounding medical care. And the two joined in 1981 with this Council on Otolaryngology basically becoming the Academy's Board of Governors, who focuses on socioeconomic and advocacy issues in our field and persists even today. Um, uh, as I was going through the pandemic, uh, trying to figure out what we were gonna do with this meeting in LA, I was very inspired by looking back at the notes from the 1945 meeting, which was canceled because transportation hotel rooms were being reserved for troops moving across the country to go fight in World War II. And uh, I loved what Dr. New wrote in his written presidential address that was mailed out to all members. No amount of reading can supplant completely the stimulating power of a large and well-organized meeting. Here, two factors are in effect. First, a direct informative one brought about by hearing a lecture, by assimilating an instruction course, or by seeing a moving picture or exhibit. And second, an involuntary or unconscious influence, which is not divinable, but actively stimulating. I never come away from a meeting of the American Academy without an increased interest in my own work. I don't know that there are truer words to describe my own experience every year at the Academy now than what Dr. New said, uh, 75 years ago. Um, as you're looking to get involved in the annual meeting as a trainee or a young physician or get involved in the academy, I think the key pathways to involvement are number one, attend the meeting, just show up. Um, for many of us in our residency training, the ticket to show up is presenting, is, is having science to present. And so you've got to get that cooking um, to sort of punch your ticket to get to go to the meeting uh, in many programs. Um, but if you just go to the meeting and don't actively engage in, in specific ways, I think you'll miss an opportunity. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides. Um, volunteer. So all academy committee meetings, uh, almost all academy committee meetings are open meetings. During the pandemic, they've had to move on to Zoom. And so it hasn't been the kind of situation where you could just walk into an academy meeting, committee meeting at the annual meeting. But I've been pushing the academy to start publicizing committee meetings, the Zoom appointments, so that these are supposed to be public open meetings to any academy member. And one of the best ways to get to know what's actually going on in the academy and the work that's going on is to show up for the committee meetings, even if you're not a member, and to volunteer for committee work, even if you're not a member. There's no better way to get onto a committee than to have already demonstrated your interest through attendance and your, your willingness to, to align your work with the committee. 
Um, for, for young physicians and residents in particular, getting involved in the academy sections, the section for residents and fellows, the section for young physicians, and the women in otolaryngology section is a critical opportunity um, to basically shrink the academy community down to size, which will give you increased access to opportunities to participate. Um, this is a special time when you're in your residency training um, where, where the adult, adult, the attending world considers you very specifically and wants to help you have opportunities to be involved and will tap you for them, but you have to show up and, and volunteer. Um, I think the, the Academy Spring Leadership Forum is one of the best ways to identify mentorship. Um, these folks on the slide, Stacey Ishman, Sanjay Parikh, Gavin Setson, Samantha N.A., Jeff Liu, and Mark Wax are all hopefully names that some of you recognize and have all become my mentors personally, um, whether peer mentors like Jeff or mentor mentors like um, Dr. Setson, um, through showing up at the spring leadership meeting and talking to people. Um, Stacy Ishman walked up to me after a talk I gave at the spring leadership meeting and said, hey, uh, I'm your mentor now, all right? And I said, yes, ma'am, that sounds wonderful. And I have leaned on her to help me with critical decision-making for the last 10 years, ever since that experience. So showing up to the Spring Leadership Forum actually is a wonderful way to develop mentorship and sponsorship outside your local environment. So if you want to present at the meeting, I'm gonna give you sort of the cheat sheet right now of how to, how to get in. The, the annual, when, when we're picking science for the meeting, there are 67 members of the committee, excuse me, 57 members of the committee who are reviewing all of the submissions. Dr. Virgin and I first got to know each other uh, on this committee when we were reviewing science together. Um, and you have to recognize that when you pick a specialty to submit your science or your poster or your panel under, when you pick a subspecialty, it's going to be reviewed by people specifically from that subspecialty um, with subspecialty-based knowledge. So there is some gamesmanship to thinking about how you could adapt your science or your uh, presentation to a broader audience that might be underexposed to your topic. For example, we get 10 submissions a year on endoscopic ear surgery, um, and the neurotologist can only pick a couple of those. Um, however, um, if you could adapt that to the comprehensive otolaryngologist setting, um, it might have a better chance of getting accepted to the meeting because it won't be reviewed by the neurotologist. It will be reviewed by the comprehensive otolaryngologist. Um, this year, we had about 3,500 um, um, actual attendees out of about 4,000 registrants. Um, so it's about a 5,000 person meeting most years. Um, your, your science is gonna be seen by an average, at least at this year's meeting of about 70 people. Um, I'm sure for some of the faculty, these are probably interesting numbers to look at how many people actually tuned in this year? How many people actually showed up in LA or showed up online? And, and the answer is a lot, a lot of people. Um, for an average didactic session, a panel or a podium to get 46 in-person viewers, 147 live stream viewers, um, that's, that's, a, that's a huge number uh, for an academy presentation. And I hope that we can see the same by maintaining an in-person and virtual environment going forward. Uh, the call for science to submit your science is coming out on December 6th. Um, these will be the formats that you can participate in. For most of our trainees, you're going to be submitting scientific podiums or scientific oral presentations for the most part. Um, however, uh, some of our trainees are going to submit uh, panels and presentation, and certainly a lot of our young faculty are looking to create instruction courses and panels. And, and i just like to honor my late little brother, um, who, uh, when he was a junior at Texas A&M, actually said to me once, Danny, did you know that if you go to class, they give you the answers to the test? I said, yes, Paul. I was aware of that fact. That's probably important. Well, the same thing applies here. Read the call for science. If you pay attention to the call for science, the instructions there, you're going to see what gap topics are most important to the academy and most likely to be picked up on this year. Go read old meeting programs to see what's already been done. And if there's an area that's already overrepresented, don't submit a, a, something in that area or else it's very unlikely to get picked up and join the committees because in the committees is where the discussions about what's hottest in our field are going on so that you can collaborate with other members from the committees um, to get your topics accepted to the meeting. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna scoot on towards scientific submissions. Again, read the call for science, follow the instructions carefully. Um, is it an emerging topic relevant for patient care? 
is your writing clear? Have your colleagues read your writing, have your co-residents read your abstract. Uh, grammatical errors and syntax are a real problem and, and get things kicked out quickly. Um, are you providing us with actual data and actual data analysis, or are you promising us data and analysis? Um, abstracts that are promising data to follow are, are kicked out from the get-go, basically. And does your conclusion match the body of, uh, and evidence level of the work, or are you overreaching? It's important not to overstate conclusions in abstracts for meeting. It, 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 I can't say how grating it sounds to read a pretty good abstract and then have a conclusion that doesn't match the abstract at all. That's another uh, landmine that gets your submissions kicked out pretty quickly. Um, I'm just going to point out here that particularly for our panel and expert series, um, we have seen still underrepresentation uh, in terms of gender diversity, in terms of presenters, uh, uh, and in terms of presenters from uh, underrepresented in medicine communities. And I would just want to urge all of you, especially faculty, you know who the underrepresented voices are in your field who have expertise. And I would strongly encourage you to reach out to those underrepresented voices and to help mentor them into submitting and presenting at the meeting. We have a goal that our meeting is representative of the body of our field. And I think that the way we get there um, is to encourage more submission from underrepresented voices. Um, what this shows you is that while 62% of the submissions for panel presentations involved at least one uh, woman uh, or person who identifies as a woman, 62% um, had at least one on the panel, only 30% of our expert series or instruction courses had a woman presenting. Um, that is an embarrassingly low number for a field with 50% of our incoming otolaryngologists, women. And so I would strongly encourage you to, to encourage others to recognize their own expertise. Um, so to get the most out of your meeting, um, I would suggest meet with a mentor ahead of time um, to talk about what you're going to do at the meeting strategically to make the most of your time there. A lot of your mentors are very gifted at, at getting the most out of medical meetings. Um, don't be afraid to walk up and say hello to anybody at the meeting. That's what we're expecting. That's what everyone's expecting at the meeting. In advance, prepare a 30 second elevator pitch about yourself to talk about who you are, where you're from and what's important to you. Um, because sometimes that's all you get is 30 seconds walking through the halls with someone to make an impression. Um, go to every trainee level event you can at the meeting and volunteer for anything you can. Um, and then after the meeting, follow up with emails for everyone that you met and had a meaningful conversation with to solidify the relationship. Finally, when you get back, debrief with your mentor about your experience, how you can capitalize on what happened to you at the meeting. And, and I just want to point out here, uh, uh, someone I'm a big fan of, Dr. Doris Mann, uh, your, your resident, um, who presented her science on um, some of the, some of the uh, features that we look at in applicants for otolaryngology residency in terms of AOA status and uh, scores and gave a phenomenal talk. It was at 7.30 on a Wednesday morning. There were six people in the room, the four presenters, no, seven people, four presenters, myself, my co-moderator, and one faculty member for one of the other talks. However, uh, the science has been seen widely on the virtual platform subsequently. And for someone uh, like Dr. Doris Mann to give such an incredible presentation, I am always gonna be looking out for her name for anything I see it on in our field going forward. And she has definitely earned my regard and uh, attention um, as a mid-level career faculty member who's involved in the academy. And so, I think that the point is the Brownian motion of us at the meetings, the way we all interact with each other in various ways, you never know how it's gonna impact you going forward and what opportunities are gonna arise that you weren't even looking for. But Christine, I'm your fan. Um, and, uh, and you did a wonderful job presenting at the meeting. So here's your action items for Philly 22. Apply to committees. The committee application cycle is open now. Read the call for science and start getting your call for science materials together. Contextualize your expertise and think widely about the underrepresented voices in our field who have expertise that they can share at the meeting um, and start planning with your mentor. I apologize for rushing the end here, um, but I know that we're close out of time. If there's time, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to share with you this morning my two greatest passions, and uh, I hope to see you all in Philly.
Any questions? Andy, that was fantastic. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Telius? Yeah, or Christina, honestly. So, so she's right here uh, with us. We all gave her a round of applause. A lot of oohs and ahs. We're extremely proud of her work. And uh, we're going to hold you to uh, elevating Dr. Dorsbund and, and other leaders here in this room as they move forward. No, I, I hope I didn't embarrass you, but seriously, it was just so she taught you, you know, you, you had me at AOA because I also led AOA for my medical school and have struggled with many of the issues you were presenting on, but how we handle them at Baylor, how I as the AOA leader handle them. And you did such a lovely presentation and it was wonderful to think about. And uh, yeah, it was great. So. Thank you. She says thanks. <laughs> Anything else? We've had a lot of great chat uh, just among my team looking at uh, how excited we are about the head and neck multidisciplinary model you built. I know we have a couple uh, head and neck guys in the room here who are looking at pediatric tumors as a potential you know, specialty going forward, uh, science and practice. And then in our own group, we're just super excited to learn about your team. And I think we're definitely going to want to pick your brain and uh, find more about the iterative steps to building this kind of multidisciplinary uh, contemporary care model that looks like it's been so effective. And I think it's, you know, hats off to the mindset of everybody there who has done it without uh, letting egos get in the way, but, but really letting each person's ability and expertise articulate so well with the other to, to provide the best kind of care. So it's fantastic work you're doing there. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the chance to visit with you. And uh, I apologize for the bit of fogginess and scatterbrainness this morning. Uh, no one is sleeping at my house with these colds right now. So uh, I'm happy to take any email questions after the fact to clarify anything too. And uh, I'm really, really grateful to get to visit with you all. Awesome. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, y'all.